Um, so now it's my pleasure to inter introduce Ray Kurzweil. Uh, I'll make this brief, but I'll tell you that there's a five-page biography on the net, which is incredibly impressive. He, Ray actually, it's something I didn't know, made his debut, made his first public debut in the world on the, on the show, What's My Line, with Steve Allen and, and all those people, because he was somebody in high school who invented his own computer, which actually composed a piece of music. Uh, this is, so Ray was like doing art, of, he was sort of like the man who was speaking prose before it had a name. Ray was uh, doing AI uh, certainly before he knew its name in, in the early days. Uh, he, was a, he was a student at MIT. Uh, he, he started a business matching, uh, matching people up with um, student, high school students with colleges uh, and early on discovered that the parents don't like it when you recommend uh, Carnegie Mellon at MIT and not Harvard. Uh, <laughs> He's, uh, he's, he started many companies. He's had a, oh, he's, uh, he started companies very early on. Was it um, first one was Kurzweil Computer Products? Uh, maybe the first notable thing, or the first time I heard his name, was when uh, when Xerox, the Xerox Corporation, purchased a, an amazing device he made called the Kurzweil Reading Machine, which did. Um, uh, OCR, which is one part of the problem, and speech synthesis to create a machine that would read to the blind. Uh, this was an astounding device for its time. This was in the 80s, I think, at least in the 80s when, when I saw it at Xerox. No, 70s when I saw it at Xerox. Uh, and, uh, and is actually still, a, still at the heart of a Xerox product that does these sort of things. Uh, he then, then went on to work on what has, in some sense, seemed like a simple, straightforward problem to specify, but has, has challenged all of us, including Raj Reddy, and that is to build a simple dictation machine. Uh, many people here, including the bakers, have worked on that problem. It's getting there. I suppose the real point about, so Ray is a, is a, is a scientist in the same spirit of Carnegie Mellon and, and Newland Simon, in the sense that he isn't just predicting things, because it's partly his book here that we're going to talk about in a minute. He doesn't just predict things, he does things. He is someone who has pushed this, this area forward. Uh, for many of you, maybe the first time you saw um, Ray's name what was, on the, was on the back of Stevie Wonder's um, uh, uh, electronic organ because Ray became a good, through, through this reading machine, he became a good friend of Stevie Wonder's and then ended up designing machines for him. Uh, so he's uh, been a prolific and astounding inventor. I won't attempt to give you, tell you the list of um, awards he's, he's received, but he did receive the, uh, the Distinguished Presidential Medal of Honor, the Presidential Measure, Measure of Science last year, which is certainly a, the, uh, a major thing, and that happened just last year. But since, I think, the 1980s, he has been the recipient of many awards, including one in, in 1994. He won the prestigious Dixon Award here at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, but the thing that caused the, the excitement recently with Ray was, in fact, his predictions. He wrote a book called The Age of Spiritual Machines, which is his third book. Uh, and a, a great thing about this book is that he actually went back and um, looked at the predictions he's made in his earlier books and uh, and ruthlessly evaluated how well they come through and uh, pretty fairly showed that he had a better than average track record of predicting the future. So, <laughs> so but it, it, was, it was believable. I mean, it was objective. Anyway, in any case, Ray uh, came here last year and gave us a, a, I think it was last year, gave a great distinguished lecture on this subject. And essentially, he said by the year, he's made the same prediction that many, so many people make, that by a certain year, in this case, 2050, I think, uh, computers will be uh, exceed human intelligence. Now, that's another 50-year prediction, and you might think, oh, well, we know about these 50-year predictions made by AI people. But uh, consider that we now have Moore's Law pushing this thing. We have more experience, and so, in fact, this prediction, whatever, it, whatever its real meaning, uh, could come through much earlier. So uh, generally speaking, because of Moore's Law, because of the increasing intelligence of um, of the humans who are exploiting Moore's law, uh, it's very important for us as scientists to, uh, to to look analytically and thoughtfully at the future. And there's no one who's been able to do that uh, more effectively and uh, in a more exciting way than Ray Kurzweil. So I'd now like to welcome him to the podium. Get all preparations in. Okay. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, Jim, you actually covered a lot of what I wanted to say. 
uh, <laughs> which I, I, I particularly appreciated your remarks about being an optimist because being an entrepreneur, you definitely have to be an, an optimist if you anticipated all the problems you're likely to encounter, you probably would never start any projects. Uh, I very much enjoy coming here to Carnegie Mellon. It has been a place that has been very successful in creating pioneering technology. I know that from my work in, in speech recognition. A lot of the pioneering work has come uh, from CMU, the Sphinx Project, uh, IBM Deep Blue Project originated here. Uh, a lot of pioneering work in robotics from Hans Moravec, uh, Kanadi, and, and others. Uh, so I have followed the work here with great interest and, and always enjoy my visits here. Uh, I have uh, been a student of technology trends for several decades. Uh, that partly emerges from being an inventor and an entrepreneur. You need your project to be relevant when it's finished, not when you start. And with the accelerating pace of progress, uh, that's a significant factor. And a lot of projects fail, at least in the commercial world, uh, because they don't catch the wave at just the right moment. You don't want to be ahead of your time uh, or, or behind the wave. Uh, so I began to study technology trends, and that kind of took on a life of its own. Uh, and by being able to to develop models uh, of where technology is going. It allows me to invent with materials and capabilities of the future uh, and not just be limited to the present. Alan Kay says to anticipate the future, you, you need to invent it, but you need to know what sort of computers, communication devices, and mechanical devices you'll have to work with. So I, I've been developing models. Uh, Hans Moravec and I have kind of an unfinished email dialogue on on some of these formulas. Uh, he's even more optimistic than I am. Uh, but uh, we're, we're kind of uh, uh, narrowing in on some, uh, on some formulas that we can both agree on. Uh, I'll show you uh, of what I saw. I've got some charts in the 1980s that led me to anticipate one of the accurate predictions in my book I wrote in 1988, which was sort of explosion of the internet into something like the World Wide Web, uh, admittedly not by that name, uh, around the mid-1990s. Uh, another prescient thing that Jim said is the difference between the exponential growth of technology, and technology does grow exponentially, and that's one of the main uh, points I'd like to share with you, uh, versus our experience of the world and technology, which is in the linear domain. People experience things linearly, uh, but technology grows exponentially, and it's the nature of an exponential curve that it basically looks like zero because it, we're doubling phenomena that's so inconsequential that nobody notices it, like the number of Internet users was you know, doubling for many, many years, but it was such tiny numbers, it, it was really not on anybody's radar screen, so it's basically zero, and then all of a sudden it explodes and seems to come out of nowhere. But if you look at these trends exponentially, you can see them. And the most powerful exponential trend is the acceleration not just of computer power, but of the paradigm shift rate itself, which is to say the rate of progress is, is growing exponentially. It's not a constant. And even though people would, are quick to agree with that, yeah, sure, things are accelerating, very few people, even thoughtful observers, really internalize uh, the radical consequences of, of what that means. Uh, I do want to comment a little bit on and Bill Joy, and I, I've been uh, on a lot of panels with him, not with the virtual Bill Joy, but uh, with the real thing. Uh, we're sort of paired as an optimist-pessimist uh, uh, pair, but very often I end up defending Bill uh, on the issue of feasibility, uh, because very often his predictions are attacked, saying, oh, that's never going to happen. Uh, Bill and I were at Harvard on a panel a few weeks ago, and one professor said, well, we're not going to see self-replicating nanotechnology entities for 100 years. And I said, uh, that's actually a good estimate, a reasonable estimate of the amount of technical progress it's going to require to create that technical milestone at today's rate of progress. But the rate of progress is accelerating, and I'm not just pulling that out of the air or basing that on casual observation. I mean, I have a model of that. I have a whole 
group collecting data on to uh, actually flesh out that model. We're doubling the paradigm shift rate every decade approximately. So we'll see 100 years of progress at today's rate of progress in about 25 calendar years. Uh, and the exponential growth of the rate of progress is going to continue to accelerate from that point on. We'll see 20,000 years of progress at today's rate of progress uh, in the 21st century. And we only saw about 25 years of progress at today's rate of progress in the 20th century, because we've been accelerating up to this point. And that was quite dramatic. Yet the 21st century will be almost a thousand times greater in terms of change, which is why some of the predictions uh, seem as unusual or startling uh, as they do. It will be a, a very dramatic century. Now, one of the key questions, uh, and Jim alluded to this issue, is Moore's Law. And there have been a lot of predictions that that's going to come to an end, and it will. Uh, I was on a panel with some Intel leaders, and uh, they were arguing, is it going to be 12 years, or is it going to be 14 years? But sometime in that kind of time frame, the key uh, dimensions uh, of key features of transistors will be only a few atoms in width, and we won't be able to shrink them anymore. And that's going to be the end of, of Moore's Law. It's going to be the end of that paradigm. But is that going to be the end of the exponential growth of computing? Moore's Law has become kind of a synonym for the exponential growth of computing. Uh, but one of the observations uh, or conclusions that I came to in studying this in more detail is that Moore's Law is really just one approach. It's one paradigm. And it wasn't the first paradigm that uh, gave us exponential growth of computing. Uh, well, the... Uh, I, I did point out the intuitive linear view of the future versus the ex historical exponential view, and we'll, we'll come back to that, because that's a really a very powerful uh, theme in terms of, of looking at the future. Um, but here's a uh, chart. Uh, you don't have to see all the detail, and that's not really very well focused, but uh, all of my charts kind of go like this, so you really just... <laughs> You just really need to see the, uh, the trend there. But that's uh, 49 famous computers over the, over the last 100 years. Uh, and that's an exponential chart. As you go up the chart, each uh, horizontal line as you go up to the next one represents a multiplication by a factor of 100 of computing power. So a straight line in an exponential chart like this means exponential growth. And one of the first things you see here is that exponential growth didn't start with Moore's law, which is a law of integrated circuits. It means that we're shrinking the size of transistors on an integrated circuit, uh, putting twice as many of them uh, every 24 months, which means twice as much stuff, and they run twice as fast because the electrons have less distance to travel, so that's a quadrupling of, of computing power every two years. Uh, but that didn't start till around 1960. Uh, and we've had exponential growth for 100 years. And Moore's Law actually was not the first, but the fifth paradigm to provide exponential growth of computing. We had electric mechanical calculators, starting with 1890 census, uh, really based computers when Turing cracked the German Enigma code, uh, vacuum tubes, uh, CBS uh, predicted the election of Eisenhower, transistor-based computers that NASA used in the first space launches. Uh, and then finally, integrated circuits. And uh, Hans has some uh, similar charts in his work. And uh, every time that one paradigm ran out of steam, another paradigm stepped in. And these other paradigms were actually under, were already well underway in laboratories before the old method ran out of steam. Uh, but finally, when one paradigm was not able to grow anymore, the new paradigm then would, would take over. They were shrinking vacuum tubes but they couldn't shrink them anymore and maintain the vacuum. Then transistors came along. And transistors are not just small vacuum tubes. It's a completely different paradigm. And the sixth paradigm that will take over when we run out of space on integrated circuits is basically the third dimension. I mean, we live in a three-dimensional world. Our brain is organized in three dimensions. Our brains are actually very, are not very dense in terms of computing. They use electrochemical processes. They're extremely slow. Uh, the calculations take place in the inner neuronal connections. They're only capable of about 200 calculations per second. This is the very slow chemical reset time. Uh, yet we get the tremendous power of the brain 
on the order of 20 million billion calculations per second, and those, those estimates vary, but that's a conservatively high estimate, because of the fact that it's organized in three dimensions. And if we were actually take conventional circuitry and organize it in three dimensions, we would get a, a computing device that's far denser in terms of its at least raw hardware capability than the human brain. Uh, and there are, by my count, at least 15 different approaches to three-dimensional computing, most of them at the molecular level. My favorite is nanotubes, which are these hexagonal arrays of carbon atoms, for, with which you can do every type of uh, electronic component by organizing the carbon atoms in different ways, and you can build them in three dimensions. They're extremely strong. They don't melt. They don't have the thermal effects. They, they're superconducting. Uh, and a, a one-inch cube of nanotube circuitry would be a million times more powerful than that 20 million billion calculations per second that at least I estimate of the human brain. So the, the sixth paradigm that will take over when the fifth paradigm of integrated circuits runs out of steam is some form of three-dimensional computing. And there are already some very impressive steps. I saw a, a cube of circuitry with 300 layers of circuitry at, at the uh, MIT Media Lab. Uh, there's exciting work being done here. Uh, there's many different laboratories in the country that are preparing that groundwork, and we have another dozen years before that needs to step in. But another issue is, I wondered, is why is this happening? I mean, is this just something unique about computer scientists? Are computer scientists more exponential than, than other types of technologists? Uh, or is there something more fundamental? And I began to look at this trend in other fields, many of which have nothing to do with computer science, and saw the same phenomena. And by the way, that's not a, just an exponential. You can see that that curve is an exponential on an exponential curve. The rate of exponential growth is growing exponentially. We were doubling computer power every three years, the beginning of the century, every two years, in the middle of the century. We're now doubling it every one year. There's exponential growth in the rate of exponential growth. Uh, so there's at least double exponential growth. Uh, Hans thinks it's a bit more aggressive than that, but uh, double exponential growth is, is pretty dramatic. Now, I won't uh, dwell on these charts. These are just other electronic manifestations, but brain scanning, this is not really, some of this is, has nothing to do with computers. The resolution of brain scanning is growing exponentially. Uh, I mean, I won't explain all the details, but these are all exponential charts. Brain scanning speed, image reconstruction time, that does have to do with computers. Genome scanning, when the Genome Project was announced, that was a pretty radical fringe project. A lot of critics said, oh, there's no way you're going to be able to do this. At the rate at which we can scan the genome, it's going to take 10,000 years to finish the project. But that accelerated. We went from uh, $10 per base pair to a tenth of a cent in 10 years. Uh, human genes map per year, genomes. Telecommunications, uh, not exactly the same thing as electronics. Uh, has been growing even more quickly than, than computers. And here's an interesting uh, chart because here you can actually see the cascade of S-curves. I mean, a lot of people come along and say, well, okay, exponential growth can't go on forever. Like rabbits in Australia, they grow exponentially, but then they, they hit a wall. Uh, either somebody tries to wipe them out or at least they run out of things to eat and the exponential growth comes to an end. And that's true. Every paradigm will run its course. It will take off exponentially and then hit an asymptote and you get this kind of elongated S-curve called the sigmoid. Uh, and if you collect enough data, and we're actually collecting more data on the computers, putting a lot, many more historical examples, and we can now see the S-curve as each paradigm shifts. You do get a leveling off and then a new technology kicks in and the exponential growth carries on. So it's innovation uh, paradigm shift that keeps exponential growth going. Uh, these are different manifestations of, uh, of telecommunications, but there's one I want to show you on the internet. Uh, here's uh, really the growth of the internet is measured by number of hosts, and there's different ways you can measure it, but the charts all look the same. And this is uh, exponential growth, because that's an exponential chart. And so 1988, I could see this marching along, but it's still, I mean, if you look at the scale, it's a little hard to read, but you can see in 1988, you're still only talking about 20 or 30,000 users. That's zero, approximately, from public perception. Nobody would notice that. But it had been doubling 
and uh, showed every sign of continuing. So that actually would reach some real numbers, like 10 or 20 million by the mid-1990s. Then it would get on the map. So this is how we experience it. This is the same data, but this is a linear chart, and that's how we experience uh, the world. So basically, nothing's happening, but then suddenly out of nowhere comes this exponential explosion of the internet uh, in the mid-1990s. But you could see it coming if you look at the exponential trends. Memory, that's another manifestation of electronics. Uh, this is the computer chart. Uh, this is actually a fairly conservative look at, at uh, continuation of that trend, and in fact, just the sixth paradigm of three-dimensional molecular computing would allow you to go just about to the end of the 21st century. Uh, certainly to 2050, we don't need another paradigm, and there's uh, many different examples of molecular computing in the wings. So right now, we're somewhere between an insect and a mouse brain. Of course, our computers aren't quite as well organized as, as mouse brains, at least not for mouse tasks. Uh, and they are very good at, at pattern recognition, but we're getting there. And I do want to talk about the software of, intelli of intelligence because uh, that's even more salient than the hardware. Uh, but we'll hit the human brain by my estimate around 2020, at least in hardware capability, uh, not, not in software. Uh, just having the raw processing power doesn't automatically give you human intelligence. Uh, not by any means, but we will have plenty of computing power in the 21st century. By 2050, which is the date we're talking about today, $1,000 of computation will equal the 10 to the 26 power calculations per second of all 10 billion human brains on Earth. So we'll have plenty of uh, computing power for some very exciting computer games. Uh, and. This, this, uh, this ripples through uh, many different uh, aspects. I mean, the, the economy has been growing exponentially. I won't dwell on these issues. But here, we actually, the growth rate of the economy is, grow, is growing exponentially because this idea that we should limit the economy to 3.5% per year, well, right now, since things are accelerating, we can do that 3.5% growth in 10 months instead of 12. So, in fact, the economy wants to grow 5%. And everybody thinks that's terrible and it's going to lead to inflation. We don't see inflation. Why? Because of the very strong deflationary forces I just showed you. I mean, for the same amount of money, we get tremendous uh, increases in power in every aspect of technology. That's a deflationary force. And people say, well, but labor shortages and rising asset values, those are inflationary. And it's true. But you have these countervailing deflationary forces, which is why you don't see inflation. Um, Human longevity is growing exponentially. We uh, added a few days to human life expectancy every, every year in the 18th century. The 19th century, we added a few weeks every year to human life expectancy. We're now adding about 120 days a year. And with the coming revolutions in genomics, proteomics, rational drug design, therapeutic cloning of cells and organs, uh, many observers, including myself, believe that we will add more than a year every year human life expectancy in, within 10 years. Uh, so if you can hang in there <laughs> for a little while longer, uh, you get to, see, get to see whether Hans and I are correct. Uh, miniaturization, another exponential trend, we're shrinking technology at a rate of 5.6 per linear dimension per decade right now, according to my model, and that factor is also growing. Uh, and that's why Bill Joy's, one of Bill Joy's uh, pronouncements of, oh, let's just relinquish nanotechnology, uh, for starters, is unrealistic. We can argue whether it's desirable, uh, but nanotechnology is not one thing. It's not, there's not one department of nanotechnology. Let's just shut it down. I mean, it's the in inevitable end result of a pervasive trend towards miniaturizing all technology uh, that's been going on for a long time. And there's thousands of different projects that are just making things a little bit smaller. And we can tell Texas Instruments, no, don't uh, create a, a projector that's higher resolution so the audience can see the screen. Or, because that will eventually lead to nanotechnology, and that's a bad thing. Or, or we're going to tell the Defense Department, don't create nanotechnology 
based devices, even though those are more effective weapons. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, these are, we don't create nanotechnology or any of these capabilities or intelligent robots or uh, self-replicating biological entities in one step. These are the inevitable end results of thousands of steps, each of which makes sense uh, because they're applied to worthwhile purposes that incrementally improve technology. Uh, but these are examples of the shrinking of te technology. This is electronics, uh, but also mechanical devices are getting exponentially smaller. Uh, I'm on a company, a company called Zyvex, which is taking a step beyond MEMS, the microelectronic mechanical systems, creating extremely tiny uh, mechanical systems that you can only see in a microscope. Uh, paradigm shift rates, again, I mean, here you can see, uh, the, as you go up the scale here, it means uh, things are getting exponentially faster, and the amount of time it took to implement uh, mass use of different inventions, mass use being defined as a quarter of the U.S. population, uh, has accelerated uh, from the telephone up to the Internet. Uh, it's the last chart I'll show you, and then I want to talk about some of the implications and talk about the software and touch upon Bill Joy's challenge about technology. But this is an interesting chart because it shows the exponential growth of technology uh, as an evolutionary process. I mean, one of the questions is, well, why, okay, computers are not the only thing growing exponentially. All these different areas of technology are growing exponentially, but why? And the reason is it's an evolutionary process, and we don't have time to discuss this in detail, but an evolutionary process builds on its past uh, products, and one level of, uh, of, of the fruits of evolution is used to then create the next level. Uh, so when biological evolution created DNA, that set the stage for much faster experiments, and so the next stage uh, didn't take as long. Uh, but the first paradigm shift, uh, development of cells and basic DNA took billions of years. By the, paradigm, by the Cambrian explosion, a paradigm shift only took a few tens of millions of years. Uh, mammals, primates, humanoids, homo sapiens only took hundreds of thousands of years. At that point, the cutting edge of evolution really moved away from biological evolution and moved to the evolutionary process fostered by the first technology-creating species. And the first uh, step of technology, stone tools, fire, the wheel, took tens of thousands of years, uh, much faster than biological evolution. And that kept accelerating. A thousand years ago, a paradigm shift only took a few hundred years. Today, a paradigm shift takes only a few years. The web didn't exist, anything like its present form, five years ago. And people say, well, look at the data, and they say, well, this isn't quite right. I mean, this particular body plan, the Cambrian explosion, didn't take 10 million years. It took 30 million years. Or the, the web didn't take five years. It really started eight years ago. Well, so I changed the data, and you still get a straight line because, you know, the Cambrian explosion didn't take place in five years, and the web didn't take a million years. Uh, <laughs> we do have an acceleration of, of, of progress and of the paradigm shift rate. And that has a profound effect on the future. And that's why we tend to underestimate what can be done in the long term. And we overestimate what can be done in the short term because we leave out details. But in the long term, people fail to consider the, the sort of revolutionary implications of uh, the acceleration of, of technical progress. Now, if we put these things together, uh, one of the things we're going to be able to do is reverse engineer the human brain. And even since Hans and my book came out, there's been some very dramatic progress uh, in that area. I met with scientist Lloyd Watts uh, in Silicon Valley area last week, who's done an excellent job of reverse engineering the human auditory system and has uh, a very detailed uh, block diagram of, of how the human auditory system works, how the data is represented at each stage. And there's six different parallel paths. And, some of these paths are analyzing where sounds come from. Other paths are analyzing the, na the nature of the source of the sounds. Other are looking for certain types of features that help with speech recognition or musical recognition. Uh, and he's actually built all of this in a model. And that, model, that computer software is able to do very convincingly many of the things that uh, the human auditory system can do. And it will be a great front end for things like speech recognition and music synthesis. But it's a very good example of the ability to reverse engineer these processes and actually understand the representation of the information in the brain, 
The brain is not one big tabula rasa. It's hundreds of specialized regions. Each of them are organized quite differently. But as we understand the structure of the neurons, as we get more brain scanning data and can actually see how the inter interconnections are, are wired up, it is possible to understand the algorithms. They're not conventional serial algorithms as we run on a notebook computer. They're massively parallel. Uh, they're necessarily chaotic. Uh, they're using self-organizing systems where no one connection is important. So they have some uh, properties in, in common with a, with a hologram. I mean, you can eliminate any of the, cut any of the wires there and the system will still work. That's not true of your personal computer. If you cut some wires in there, it probably won't work. Uh, but those engineering principles can also be used in our machines and in my area of work, which is pattern recognition, that's exactly how we do things uh, using self-organizing systems. Uh, but at, by uh, 2030, we'd be able, if you look at all these trends, miniaturization, uh, exponential growth of computation, communications, we could send billions of nanobots, little robots, smaller than the ones Hans makes, uh, through the capillaries of the brain, uh, and they could scan the brain from inside. We already have technology which today can see neural features extremely high resolution, uh, if the scanning tip is right next to the neural features. So we could scan my brain today if we just move the scanning tip uh, you know, next to every neural feature. But if you want to do that without making a mess of things, you would send the scanners inside the brain. You'd need billions of them. They'd all be on a local area network, wireless, communicating with each other, compiling this massive database. And then you would have uh, the equivalent of what we have now with the Genome Project, which is just the raw data of how the brain is organized then we would have to reverse engineer that, which is a painstaking process, but uh, there's a lot of work already with the, with the brain scan data and understanding of neurons that we already have uh, that show that that's uh, eminently feasible. There's similar work being done on the, the motor system, on visual, the visual uh, neurological system, uh, and other aspects of the brain that we, that we do have the data for. Um, these same, neuro, these same uh, nanobots would, will be able to communicate with our neurons. Uh, that's another technology that exists today in crude form. Uh, a neuron transistor can detect the electromagnetic pulse when a neuron fires, which is communication from the neuron to the electronics. Uh, conversely, the neuron transistor can cause a, a neuron to fire or suppress it from firing. Uh, so you could, for example, have uh, uh, full immersion virtual reality where uh, the nanobots take up positions next to the nerve fibers coming from all of your senses. They shut down the signals from your real senses, replace them with the signals you would be receiving if you were in the virtual environment, and then you feel like you're in the virtual environment. And then you, your brain, decides to be an actor in that virtual environment, move your hand in front of your face. It doesn't move your real hand, it moves your virtual hand. So I see it, I can hear it, People who are in this shared virtual environment with me can see and hear it as well because I don't have to have the same body and appearance uh, in virtual reality that I have in real reality. Uh, depends what I'm trying to accomplish. Uh, <laughs> but uh, certainly uh, well into this 50 year period, meetings like this will take place in virtual environments. Uh, we could pick this lovely hall or we could meet on a Cancun Beach or take a stroll through a virtual uh, Mozambique game preserve. We will have visual and auditory uh, virtual reality much sooner than that. Uh, I mean, our experience here is mostly visual and auditory. Uh, drawing upon technology that exists today, not in refined enough form, but if we apply these trends uh, by 2010, uh, we'll be walking around, images will be written directly to our retina from our eyeglasses and contact lenses. We'll have high bandwidth connection to the internet at all times. The electronics for all this, computation and communications will be so tiny, they'll be in your glasses or woven in your clothing. So you won't see computers, will be plugged in all the time and able to enter at least visual and auditory virtual reality environments. That'll be the nature of the World Wide Web. Going to a website will mean entering a virtual reality environment. Uh, the as we learn how the brain is organized, we'll be able to use that, those insights as basically biologically inspired models for more intelligent computation. That's what we've done already. 
the speech recognition work done here and that was done in my company made use of uh, an understanding of the transformations that are done in the early auditory uh, processing system in the brain. So as we understood more about those transformations, we applied them in software and got better results in speech recognition. Uh, we use things like neural nets, which are becoming more sophisticated as we actually have better models of how the neural nets in the brain work, so we can develop more sophisticated systems uh, for neural nets or genetic algorithms or Markov models and other, other forms of chaotic computing, which are basically biologically inspired. So that's how we'll gain the software of intelligence. Uh, it'll, it'll be a combination of drawing inspiration from the brain as we understand that better, as we're able to look at it better and have more information about it, as well as ongoing experimentation and in, in artificial intelligence, such as done here. Uh, and we will have more and more intimate connection between our technology and, and ourselves. Uh, it'll be on our bodies by the end of this decade and in our glasses and in our clothing. It's already getting very close to us. It's, it's certainly tying us all together as a, as a civilization. Uh, it'll begin to go in our bodies. And that's, that's already starting. We're already on the early stages of that. I have a deaf friend who was profoundly deaf. I can actually talk to him on the phone because of his cochlear implant. Uh, there are Parkinson's patients that actually have the cells uh, that are destroyed by that disease, at least in the first eight years, replaced by a, uh, a new neural implant. Uh, these are surgically implemented, uh, but we're actually putting intelligent machines in our computers. A point that Hans makes is that uh, when we actually understand the algorithms of the brain, we can implement them in software with fewer computes, fewer computations than you would get by just doing an estimate of how many computations all the different connections are theoretically capable of doing. And that's, that certainly seems to be true. This model of the auditory system I mentioned is, uh, uses less computation by a factor of a thousand, but is able to match uh, the capabilities of the brain. Let me just, uh, since we're running out of time, say a few words about the, the Bill Joy issue. Uh, technology has always been a double-edged sword. You don't have to look further than today to see the uh, destructive potential of technology. Uh, I'm not a techno-utopian. I tried to describe in my book uh, both the positive and negative aspects of it. Uh, the, and as I mentioned, I very often defend Joy uh, in terms of the feasibility of his scenarios, because I, I do think these dangers are, are real. Uh, however, I think uh, his uh, call for relinquishment of broad areas like nanotechnology, intelligent robotics, is utterly unrealistic because it's not one, it's not one thing. Uh, it's really uh, the end result of pervasive trends in technology. You would have to basically stop all technology. That is uh, the recommendation of people like Kaczynski. The only way you could actually implement that would be in a totalitarian state enforced by technology, a la Brave New World. Uh, that is realistically the only way that you could do that. Otherwise, the, the progression of technology is inevitable. And I think a very positive thing. I mean, the dangers we have today are very uh, daunting. On the other hand, few people today would really want to go back uh, to 200 years ago where human lifespans were half of what they are today and 99% of the human population lived lives that were extremely labor-intensive, poverty-stricken, disease-prone, disaster-prone, uh, and, and very difficult. Um, and we still have a lot of human suffering. Uh, Biological research is going to make enormous strides in alleviating disease and other forms of distress, but it's these same technologies that, they, that can then be used for malevolent purposes. The promise and peril of technology is deeply interwoven. You can't get rid of one without the other. And it's a complex subject, but basically the way to deal with it is the way that we do deal with it, which is through ethical standards of professionals, law enforcement, and technological safeguards. And I'll just leave you with one final point, which is to take the example of computer viruses, which is a new form of self-replicating entity. It didn't exist a few decades ago. When it first emerged, some observers said, oh, this is terrible. As these get more sophisticated, it's going to shut down computer networks and destroy their effectiveness. Well, how well have we done? Well, computer viruses continue to be a concern, maybe a grave concern, but they're really a, more at the level of a nuisance. No one would suggest we do away with the internet and computers and networks because of computer viruses. Their damage, you know, even though it's in billions of dollars, is one-tenth of one percent of the benefit we get from computer networks. 
Now, someone would say, well, wait a second. Computer viruses aren't potentially lethal. The things that Joey's talking about, self-replicating biological pathogens, self-replicating nanotechnology entities, which could be a non-biological cancer, would be lethal. Isn't that a, a danger of, at a different level? I think that only strengthens my argument. If we've been able to deal as effectively as we have with computer viruses, that, despite the fact that they're not lethal, uh, if we have lethal entities, far few people would put them out. I mean, a lot of the people that put out computer viruses are hackers doing it as a practical joke. They wouldn't do it if they felt they were killing people. And moreover, our response to the danger would be 100 times more intense in terms of technological safeguards, law enforcement. So if, given our relatively lackadaisical response to computer viruses and we've been able to keep them at bay, at least uh, gives me hope as, as a professional optimist that uh, we'll be able to deal with these uh, more potentially lethal dangers as they emerge. But the story of the 21st century hasn't been written yet. These dangers are real. I think we inevitably will have to face them. We can overcome many uh, profound problems that the human race has struggled with for millennia uh, with some of these technologies. Uh, but one of the great, great challenges of the 21st century will be to deal effectively with, with the downside of technology. Thank you. All right, our uh, 